can go to the next one. So micronutrition. So I was just mentioning I like to keep potatoes in the diet. Um, over restrictive diets lead to micronutrient deficiencies, which impair health, uh, muscle building and drive fatigue. So well, as I was mentioning earlier, we don't want to eat just pop tarts and protein powder. We want to have some nutrient dense foods. Usually I build the base amount of my calories off nutrient dense foods, lean proteins, um, lots of fruits and veggies, different colored fruits and veggies, different grains and things like that. And then I start putting in those hyper palatable foods. Now, um, Basically, these are some of the ones, the main ones that we can run into. Um, and, and if you really want to see an extreme example of micronutrient deficiencies, this also relates to their, their status, like being in a dieted state. But a lot of um, bikini competitors, their, their coaches will put them on egg whites, egg white diets, tilapia, no fat at all, have them do hours of cardio, and they get what's called the female triad, which is uh, a loss of menstru menstrual cycle, uh, low bone mineral density, density, and I can't remember the third one. But that would be an extreme uh, uh, example of that. They start losing their hair. They get all these really bad compositions, uh, comp compensation, sorry. And some of the contributing factors are due to micronutrient deficiency, especially with the bro bodybuilder coaches who think dairy is bad, think eggs are bad, think fruit is bad. They start running into a lot of these problems. So generally speaking, we just want to have a diverse amount of food in the diet. Potatoes, fruit or beans are great potassium sources, potato being the best. Potassium is really important for blood pressure and blood pressure becomes really important as your body weight starts increasing. Um, you can actually get potassium from no salt as well. What I do is I take iodized salt and no salt and I mix it in a three to one um, mixture. It, it actually seems in the data that if you reduce, you take your uh, sodium intake and you actually replace some of it with potassium, your risk of all cause mortality and uh, cardiovascular disease uh, is reduced a lot. No salt to potassium salt. You can get it at like any grocery store. It literally just says no salt on the label. It actually, um, in, in the studies, it actually, so it tastes a little bit salty, but it, in the, uh, when they were comparing taste, it actually tasted better than salt, like by the people who were researched. So I mix it in, I don't really notice the difference. Um, magnesium, usually best source is supplements. You can get some from like nuts and spinach and stuff like that, but probably just a supplement. Uh, specifically, uh, I, citrate might be okay, but uh, glycinate or biglycinate, I think are the best, most bioavailable forms. Uh, calcium, uh, Dairy, if you don't tolerate dairy well, try going for the lower dairy uh, sources such as cheddar cheese, Greek yogurt, um, just because calcium is so important for like muscle contraction, things like that. If you can't do that, try powdered eggshell powder. Uh, you can probably get that at like veterinary stores, but it's edible. Um, that's gonna be your best bet. And then otherwise, supplementing calcium sources, uh, like, like supplements, there's actually some data, and I don't know how much this holds, I never actually looked into it myself, but uh, that supplementing with calcium actually uh, Increase all cause mortality. I don't know how true that is or how it holds up, but really I would just, uh, it's not super bioavailable. So, I mean, if it's your only choice, then go for it. Um, let's see, iodine source. Uh, cranberry juice, not from concentrate, is a great iodine source. Uh, you can also go with iodized salt. Uh, there was a study in Japanese athletes and they found that like, I don't know, a large percentage, like 70% were, were deficient in iodine and we lose iodine through our sweat. It's really important for thyroid function. So if at minimum iodized salt, Trader Joe's has a cranberry juice, not from concentrate, that's pretty cheap. Four ounces a day, more than enough to get enough iodine. Uh, and then we, as I mentioned, omega-3, or you can do, uh, as a supplement, two to three grams a day, or you can do 700 grams of fatty fish, two whole eggs to your uh, uh, cholesterol requirements, and then some red meat. Um, can't see the nutrients it contributes, but it's a, it's a good amount of uh, uh, nutrients. Uh, zinc, uh, B12, uh, iron, magnesium, all these really great stuff from red meat, so I usually like that as a protein source, at least in some meals. Uh, and then rest are polyunsaturated fats, are nut butters, seeds, oils, vegetable oil, all that good stuff. Now, look, most people, it's gonna be really hard to do all this. I'm a bit of like a control freak, so I obviously have all this stuff in my diet, but just try your best to have these, maybe even throughout the week if you can, try to have some of the stuff in your diet in, in a rotation and you should be okay. And again, you can always reference chronometer. Uh, it's a great way. There, you can add the reference for iodine. They have a, an RDA for it, but you can just literally look at chronometer and it'll show red if you're not in the requirement. And it'll show green if you are. So it's pretty simple at the end of the day. Put in what you eat for a couple days, collect the data. Oh, I'm deficient in this. Okay, eat some more spinach. What foods have vitamin K in them? Okay, boom, add a little bit of that. Um, hydration. So everybody like, oh, you got to drink a gallon a day. You see people carrying around a gallon. Really just... Uh, Oh yeah, you got Brandon here with the gun. <laughs> um, but it, it doesn't matter. Just drink when you're thirsty. You, it, it may, there may be some benefit for um, like you know drinking a little bit more, especially in a hot climate. It actually isn't a bad idea to kind of drink uh, 
uh, ahead of your thirst because in a hotter climate like like in Arizona uh, or if you're if you're uh, someone who sweats a lot we don't notice that we're losing fluid and the, the thirst actually lags a little bit behind our hydration status um, so for the most part it's actually not a bad idea in our climate because we, we, we dry sweat like the sweat due to low humidity dries off us really quick so uh, yeah maybe a good idea to have uh, a little bit more water than you think especially if you're working out maybe have some fluid with you uh, essentially to be able to tell if you're properly hydrated uh, just you you want to be for, for a workout you want to be weight neutral so basically you want to weigh the same at the beginning and end of the workout so you can weigh yourself before the workout and after the workout um, and really you just want to determine uh, how much fluid you're losing and then compensate with that with with um, probably a solution with water and some electrolytes now we lose uh, electrolytes in our sweat, so we want some thermo tabs. Uh, usually is the best way to get them in. You can also just down some salt. For the most part, if you're salting your meals pre and post workout to taste, then you should be okay. Uh, but sometimes if you sweat a lot, you might need some, some sodium in the middle of the workout. Uh, there's also like a liquid IV and stuff like that. I'm not sure if those are significant enough. I like thermo tabs because they do have potassium as well, which is another uh, contributor to hydration. Uh, and then we have our potassium sources, no salt, fruit, potato, as I mentioned. Magnesium, you get through a dietary supplement, and calcium uh, through a dairy source. Now, sodium, um, just salt your foods to taste, really. Iodized salt's great because you'll get your iodine too. So. Uh, troubleshooting appetite. So, uh, as you see, you have Snoop Dogg smoking here. Uh, marijuana is, is a good way, uh, specifically edibles. Uh, it's usually like a, a last resort for the most part. You want to try all this stuff first. If you're consuming edibles every day to try to eat enough food, you might have a problem on your hands. Um, basically, use lower FODMAP fruit and ve vegetables um, because, again, like I mentioned, uh, gas and bloating can con contribute to your appetite being limited. Um, we really don't want to be just consuming mass gaining shakes and, you know, uh, cream of rice or whatever, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, so consume your fiber minimum of 40 grams. You can push that up if you, if you don't have an appetite as a limiting factor, especially if you're using performance enhancing drugs. Uh, what will happen is you can bring your LDL way down by bringing your fiber up. But again, you want to weigh that against the cost of appetite. Um, and then stay active. So keeping yourself active throughout the day will contribute to your appetite, keeping it up. Um, so that may be another reason or another argument for keeping your activity level higher. Uh, food palatability reward hypothesis. Essentially, your, uh, the tastier your food is, the more you want to eat of it. That was that problem with the dirty bulking earlier. But it can be used to our advantage in a mass gaining phase because appetite starts becoming a limiting factor. So we might want to add in some of these more palatable foods in order to get in enough calories. So we got our base micronutrients, we got our base, uh, you know, whole foods and stuff like that. What we start doing is adding these foods on top. Uh, let's like give my day, for example, I'll wake up and have like some toast with eggs in the morning, right? And some spinach. But then after a workout, I'm not as hungry, I'll have some skim milk and cereal and I'll get in like 200 grams of carbohydrates right there in a whey shake. Then the rest of my meals might be whole, whole food based depending on how my appetite's going for the day. Um, and then uh, basically, uh, yeah, more cal calorically dense, tasty processed foods um, after meeting your micronutrient requirements, as I mentioned. Nutrient timing, a lot of people put uh, too much into this. And, whoops. Um, one thing I wanna mention is I don't think I added in the actual meal frequency. Really, all you gotta think about meal frequency, three to five meals a day is ideal. You can push it a little bit more, but there's nearly no benefit. Too low and you're not getting enough uh, protein, because what happens is we're not, we have no storage me mechanism for protein in the body, so we need muscle, multiple feedings of protein in order to hit what's called the leucine threshold and uh, keep muscle protein synthesis elevated all day. So three to five meals, really easy. I personally consume four, and I have uh, 4,300 calories in my day. It's pretty easy. It, it, it actually helps me a lot with adherence because I am also pretty busy throughout the day, so I don't have to stop and eat as many times. Uh, so you just have your meals a little bit bigger, uh, but sometimes that can be a limiting factor. Sometimes meals can be too big for some people. So uh, like I was talking to Brandon about, maybe having a higher meal frequency might help you. So you can play around with that really. Um, but with specific nutrient timing, it's, it's like, like, like we're, we're looking at that pyramid. It's like way up here. It's, very, it's not super important, but it, it does have some importance. If you're eating enough nutrients throughout the day, eating enough protein, training with weights, it's, it's not of a uh, huge significance. So... Um, Basically, you need about 1.5 grams per, this is adapted from kilograms. Kilograms, it's 0.3, I believe. So that's roughly, I think it's like 0.13 uh, to be exact for pounds, but I just say 1.5 grams per pound of protein is enough to trigger muscle protein synthesis. Um, Post-workout, you may be able to benefit from more. So you may be able to double that number. So 
something like 40 grams or 0.2 grams. And uh, you may actually be able to bias um, some of your protein after in, in the post-workout window uh, because muscle protein synthesis is elevated. So for example, if you train in the morning, uh, you may just want to do an even protein distribution, uh, but you can actually have at least maybe one higher meal of protein. But say you train in the evening even, you got two more meals. You train, you have a meal of you know, 0.2 grams, and then you actually potentially elevate the amount of protein in your last feeding and in the, in the morning in order to account for that because protein synthesis uh, takes time. Uh, I don't know if I put this in here, but protein synthesis can be elevated for, man, uh, four hours to 72 hours, four hours for an advanced trainee. So uh, if we have muscle protein synthesis still elevated, we may be able to get away with more protein. Really, post-workout, you could just have a little bit more and you could just try to hit that number for the most part. For, for that meal, yeah, yeah. And then post-workout, potentially a little more, yeah. So um, I would just keep it as a minimum. Maybe you wanna hit like mid-range in a meal. So like that's how you would determine meal frequency too, is if you have too many meals and you're not even hitting that number, then I consider having less, you know what I mean? Um, training fasted, it isn't advisable, but really it's not that hard. You just gotta eat a small amount of protein, maybe a protein shake, half 15 grams of carbs, and you'll be more than fine uh, as far as that. So. Really, you can drink a shake, you could have just some smoked meat or something like that, and you'll be fine. Just try not to train completely fasted as it uh, tends to cause more muscle protein breakdown. And just all you need is just that much to basically um, prevent muscle from being broken down. Uh, the larger pre-workout meal, the longer you're gonna wait to train. So not something super big, keep fats lower around the workout window. Bias more of your calories around the workout window and potentially more of your protein as well. Yeah, what's up? The problem with only having one or two meals is that you don't, you, because I mentioned you need this, what's called the leucine threshold, you need to meet that, and there's no storage mechanism for protein. So what'll happen is you'll have hours of, of lower uh, muscle protein synthesis, uh, basically where you're not building, you're not getting adequate protein. So if you were to do something like that, I would say at least hit your, your minimum of protein. So have a shake a couple times a day, really a shake with like some fat, or have just a smaller meal, and then you could bias some of those calories more. But usually you would want to, try to plan ahead a little bit to be able to not be in a situation like that super frequently. But in a, in a pinch, at least try to hit your protein numbers. Like you're on vacation, bring some protein bars with you throughout the day and then you could have a big meal at, at dinner at night. Go to the next one. Cool, anabolic window. Um, so that's what, uh, what I was mentioning earlier. So uh, exists much longer than people think. So it's not like immediately after the workout you have to eat uh, a bunch of food. Uh, you have 24 to 72 hours in the beginner. So it's really elevated for days after. Uh, an advanced training is maybe four hours, but still a pretty large window. I would say still just try to get it in a couple hours after your workout, but but if you're like stuck or you have to do something after training, you're not in a really compromised state if you have to do this. Really, I think uh, if you're training, you wanna probably have about six hours that you can play around with. So like if you ate, trained immediately after that, uh, you would still probably wanna have a meal within four hours, but you don't wanna have, go longer than six hours around a workout without eating. Um, 0.3 grams uh, protein within this time should be uh, enough to trigger max muscle protein synthesis. Sorry, that's per day. I don't know why I put that. Uh, it's 0.15 grams, my, my apologies. Uh, or is it, no, yeah, yeah, sorry, 0.28. I, I average this out. So it would be the, the, the number that I mentioned where you can consume more protein post-workout. Uh, 0.28, 0.3 grams post-workout would probably be enough to maximize muscle protein synthesis. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, try to bias more your daily protein towards the post-workout period of the day. Uh, carbs be more beneficial around training. Fats may be beneficial on periods of lower activity. So you train early in the morning, mostly carbs, lower fats, more fats distributed towards the evening. Very minor difference, but. All right, uh, peri-workout nutrition. I put John Meadows up here because he's like one of the first people I ever heard peri-workout nutrition from. Uh, one of the people who really got it popularized based on like some, some data. Uh, very limited, but uh, it's really cool that there is some more data to substantiate his anecdote um, that he believed in. Um, really uh, limited fats. This is, again, advanced trainees. If you are uh, you know, beginner, intermediate, probably don't need this as much. Uh, if your workout is, long, is, is shorter than an hour, probably don't need this either, but it is a great way to get in some extra nutrition. Um, you can really just look at the numbers here. Uh, you can actually have some protein in the middle of your workout. Uh, I usually do some whey protein, uh, chocolate whey protein with um, 
uh, Fruit Punch Gatorade. It tastes like a Tootsie Pop. Pretty good. Um, that's usually how I do that uh, as far as getting those in. Uh, I might put some sodium or thermo tabs in there. It's not, it doesn't make it taste gross or anything. Um, and uh, maybe my creatine too, might throw all that in. And then just limited protein, or sorry, limited um, fats around the workouts. But these specific numbers, really, if you're just biasing more of your carbs and low, less fats, it's totally fine. You don't have to be specific. Okay, 